Hello, everyone. Welcome to another online event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our friends from the Software Crafts Romandy community. My name is Peti Koch, and I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland today. Uh, my co-host from, uh, from the SCR, Alexander Guva, will join us uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, we will start without him. Today, it's a pleasure for me to have uh, Alex, Alex Bolboaca with us. Hi, Alex. Everything OK? Hi, Petty. All good. Thank you. You're based in Romania. That's right. Yes. Usually, I was used to traveling around Europe, but these days, uh, I'm mostly stuck in Bucharest, yes. OK. So before we start with uh, Alex and his talks, I have a couple of slides prepared and I'll explain a couple of things. Um, first, the big thank you to all our sponsors for their support. Then uh, in the tool you're using here in the Big Marker webinar uh, tool, you have a chat tab and a question and answer tab. Uh, please use the chat tab, for example, to write in where are you from, where are you located right, right now. And if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A tab. You can also upvote there the questions and we will pick them up uh, later. If you want to get in touch with us, with our community, there's a, a Slack workspace for the Java User Group Switzerland. You can see the URL here on this slide. You can uh, ask us questions, or if you want to uh, present something yourself, or you have a, an idea for an interesting e event, get in touch with us. The same is true for our friends from the Software Crafts from Monday Meetup Group. Um, here you see a picture of the meetup page. Um, you can uh, get there in touch with the community. And uh, we will record this talk and uh, upload it on YouTube. Here you can see the link of the YouTube channel of the Java User Group Switzerland. You have the option to subscribe to the channel, and if you click the bell, you will get an email notification when the new talk is ready and published. The same is true for our friends from SCR. They also have a YouTube channel. And then um, after the talk and the Q&A part, we will switch the online tool. We will switch to uh, Wonder dot me uh, video uh, conference room. This is a very interesting platform where you can move freely and talk just to the people you really want to. So you have a little avatar and you can move around your avatar and you can build uh, small circles and have, have a chat each other, with each other. Um, you will have also the opportunity to speak with Alex. He will also join us so you can talk to him uh, in person. If you're interested in uh, upcoming in events, we have uh, some events already prepared in April, for example. For example, an event with Sander Mancuso. Then in May, an event with uh, Marco Consolaro about uh, connaissance and more events are in the pipeline. Just subscribe to the mailing list of the Java User Group Switzerland or um, be part of the meetup group from, from our SCR friends. So that's everything from my side. Now it's time for Alex. And um, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. All right. Well, it, it's very nice to, to be here, first of all, even if it's virtually. <laughs> it's really nice to uh, be part in this uh, community event. Um, 
particularly since uh, there are a few topics that I believe are difficult to speak about at conferences and at other types of events. Uh, topics that are best suited for a forum where we can actually discuss about their impact and about how to apply them and kind of figure out together as a community what can help us uh, from these uh, topics. So what I'm hoping today is not so much to uh, dump a lot of uh, information on you, but it's more to give you the groundwork uh, and the, a model that we, we can start from and build upon uh, in order for each of us uh, who wants to become better at what we are doing, uh, in order for each of us to adapt this model and to make it work for ourselves. So I'm Alex Bolboaca. I am a CTO at Mosaic Works. I'm also doing trainings. I'm also doing uh, coaching. Um, I've been doing a lot of work uh, recently on uh, developing uh, learning programs uh, and you'll hear a bit about those for uh, for companies that and for teams that are they needed to be um, online um, and in from all my experience one thing that I noticed while doing coaching while doing whether it was agile transformation, whether it was adoption of XP practices or other or learning programs or teaching people or mentoring, pair programming with uh, programmers. One thing I kept noticing again and again and again is how much the habits that we have every day uh, at work make us better or make us worse. And so what today, what I want to discuss today is a bit about the psychology of habits. Uh, and it so happens that in the past years, there has been quite an advance on the science uh, behind habits. We know now much more than we used to know about uh, this part of psychology, and we know how important habits are for performance, for career development, for personal fulfillment. So it's not only about, you know, making, uh, being better in a team or being better as a professional, but it's also about your personal fulfillment, how you feel at the end of the day, whether you feel you know, tired and annoyed or whether you feel better or challenged and excited about the next day. So this psychology of habits is a very important part of uh, this part of being, feeling better as a software developer, being better as a software developer. And I think this is uh, particularly well fitted if we discuss in the context of software craft, which is about, you know, raising the bar, building more and more skills and abilities and developing new techniques and learning from each other so that uh, we can do better uh, and we feel better and we take more responsibility. So this is a quick introduction about what I will uh, tell you today. Uh, by the way, I'm coming to you from uh, the Mosaic Works studios from Bucharest. Uh, we have a really nice studio here that we are used to record learning programs and various other things, conversations with interesting people in from software development, all kinds of things. And I kind of moved towards this video side. And because of this, I don't have slides today. Uh, I've experimented in the past year with um, using instead of slides, video. I think video has a much powerful impact, especially when we are remote. 
So what I have for you today and what you will see uh, on your side is a video that I prepared and I will kind of start and stop it and pause it and uh, move around it because it will show you so much more than uh, I think slides can, at least that's my experience. So with this being said, uh, let's hit play. Good habits for developers. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I would like to thank um, Betty and Alexander and Marcus for making all this happen and for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic, which is not a very common one to, to discuss. And I really hope we'll have some very interesting conversations. So the fundamental, the short story of today is the following. Uh, we are driven by habits. Uh, you will see that about 40% of the daily decisions are made unconsciously using habits. And there's a biological reason for that. They are used to reduce brain energy consumption. But what happens is that some of the habits help us and some others don't. And as software crafters, as professionals, we want better habits. So this is the premise. Uh, this is the short question that we are asking. So given this, what do we do? But before we move on and discuss this, uh, we have to lay out some groundwork. So first of all, what I'd like you to do is, can you type in the chat some good habits that you think you have? It's voluntary, it's not mandatory, of course, but it would be a nice warm up for yourself, even if you don't share with us a list to think about some good habits that you have. And I will wait for a few seconds and then I will tell you, I will share some of my good habits. So a few good habits that I have, right? I see a few of them. Uh, exercise, working up each day, meditation, yoga, take notes while working on any task, <laughs> clean teeth, yeah, that's a really good one. Trying to use the keyboard most of the time, spell checking, practice, think before coding. I see a lot of good, uh, of good ones. Um, some of my habits include, for example, uh, I, I used to mumble to myself about what I am doing if I'm not pairing, and this helps me focus on the things that I'm trying to achieve. Um, I, uh, I turn off notifications on all the applications in my, uh, on my phone, so they don't interrupt me and I can focus for long periods of time because of that. Um, what other good habits? I also love to work, right? Uh, so that's good. All right, now let's see the, the other side. We have some good habits and that's good. But now the question is, what are some bad habits that we have? Some things that we are doing and we don't necessarily like. We like to change. Uh, this can be personal, but perhaps related to development would be even more interesting. Uh, checking mail, eating snacks in front of the TV, uh, eating chocolate <laughs> when frustrated, yeah. We'll talk a bit about these triggers. Um, one of my bad habits is that I, I get focused on a task and I forget to rest my eyes for a long period of time. Uh, so that's something that I'd really love to change. 
Um, what else? Also, uh, sometimes I sit down uh, a lot while doing the work. So I forget to, I get so focused and so into something that I forget to get up and you know, do some movement. Um, very impatient during daily sprint retros. I see a few others searching solutions before I know the problem throughout. Yeah, that's a very common one. Doing other stuff while attending online meetings. That might be yeah, a bit of, a, of an issue. OK, thank you for sharing all this. This is great. So now these are some good habits and some bad habits. But let's, let's step back a bit and let's look at what's happening inside your brain. Because this is the most important part. If you think about you know, the tools that we use as software developers, the brain is probably the most important one, right? I mean, we use hands to type. We use, uh, uh, we read stuff and we write stuff and so on. But probably, you know, we need to make a lot of decisions. We need to read code. We need to understand code. We need to think about alternate solutions and so on. These are all parts of our brain. And our brain is very interesting in the sense that you know this picture probably. Um, and it has this frontal lobe, which is here in the front of your uh, head. Uh, this is the last part of the brain that evolved. And it's also the first one that gets tired. And this leads to a few interesting challenges because that part of the brain has is responsible for decision making for attention for planning so the decisions whenever you make decisions this is the part of the brain that you you work with and that part of the brain is the first one that will get tired i don't know if you've ever been You've probably experienced this if you go home after a long day where you had to make a lot of decisions and uh, and you feel like you cannot even pick what you want for dinner or something like that, something even very simple. It's just, you know, if there's something default, then that would be perfect. So this is uh, why knowing this little bit about your brain is is useful just remember this the decision making is getting tired very quickly fundamentally your brain is lazy now this doesn't mean that it doesn't stay up it's actually up all the time but various parts of your brain shut down to uh, to reduce the energy consumption because your brain is consuming a lot of energy and so it's trying to reduce this and it is very lazy and it wakes up from time to time uh, and it pays attention to stuff and then it goes back to let's say the <clears throat> uh, the normal line the baseline and it uses shortcuts to conserve energy what types of shortcuts pattern matching it's one of them right you see something and you immediately match it with a pattern or you hear something and it's never it's not necessarily the same um, it's not necessarily what it is supposed uh, to be but you see a pattern there habits which is what we'll be talking about and it's also fooling you on things like perception memories and logic um, i want to insist here but um, for example we see memories often as a hard drive where your brain is storing a precise uh, image of a memory and then recovers it later, that's absolutely not true. Uh, your brain will store just the, the essence of a memory and then the least, the, if you don't use that memory a lot, then it kind of fades away and if you try to remember it, it reconstructs things around it. And that's why uh, you often hear 
if you discuss with people that you've met a long time ago and you know that some event happened, they often have forgotten and they remember a completely different version of that event. Uh, this is why, you know, you need to pay a lot of attention to, you know, memories. You need to pay a lot of attention for things like uh, logical fallacies, which are fundamentally a type of pattern matching that goes wrong. But anyway, we'll focus on habits. And there is one example that I'm sure you've seen again and again, which is optical illusions. If you see a face here, please notice that there is no face. Right? There is only a bunch of um, horses and birds, and, and that's it. There is no face, actually. But what you see is a face because the pattern matching is fooling you. So this is just to tell you that your brain is lazy. It's trying to uh, reduce energy consumption. And since we laid down this work, it's probably time to look at uh, the next thing, which is, of course, understanding what habits are. And here I have some interesting facts about habits. It's an article from, uh, you can see the URL, theworldcounts.com, Happiness Psychology of Habits. Um, and 40% of actions are not conscious decisions, but habits every day, which means that a lot of your life is actually around habits, good or bad which means you can take control of your life by changing habits. And maybe the most important part, maybe something that you don't know, habits never disappear. Habits go so ingrained ever since you are a child, they get uh, reinforced, 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 and they go, get so ingrained that you cannot actually change them. And Perhaps one simple thing that you may have realized if you have grown up in a house, uh, but then left it uh, and you haven't lived there for many years, but you go back on Christmas or whatever, holidays um, uh, to visit your parents, then often you fall back into your old habits into that house habits that you've never used uh, for many, many years sometimes. This shows that actually your habits are still there, but they also depend on the context. So habits do not disappear. They are overpowered by other habits. One interesting thing, uh, the daily habit of self-acceptance is the one that contributes to happiness the most. So if you really want to, if you feel like you could be happier or more content with yourself, one way is to accept, to think about yourself and to accept uh, your issues, your problems. And that's something that each of us needs to do because none of us is perfect, right? We all have our own problems. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we make repeated mistakes. And accepting that is something that makes you feel better at the end of the day. And then cravings are what motivates the brain. So a habit is driven by a craving. If you crave to be, I don't know, better professional, if you crave to no TDD more. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's something that, <laughs> that might help you. And then let's look at how habits form. Um, and it's interesting here to see that, again, habits are our, the way of our brains to increase efficiency. If you had to think about every single decision in your day, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. You wouldn't be able to function. 
so this, it's good to have good habits because these habits will actually free your mind for the important stuff, for the important decisions, for those times when, I don't know, there's an issue in production and you need to be fully attentive to wake up <laughs> completely, be focused, solve things. Um, but as long as you have the good habits and you use them during the day, those you'll reduce your energy consumption in the brain and you'll be sharp, you'll be ready to go. Whereas if you have to, you know, if you use some bad habits, it won't necessarily happen, right? And then um, the first time you do something, it requires a lot of concentration and brain power, but then you repeat, they go, they become easier. You repeat, they become easier. And this is something called chunking. Uh, you have a lot of chunks of behaviors that you use unconsciously during the day. And I like this quote that follows. Um, it says, uh, brains are in the business of gathering information and steering behavior appropriately. It doesn't matter whether consciousness is involved in the decision making, and most of the time it's not. Uh, and often our brains fool us that we are conscious about some decisions. One really scary thing uh, or weird thing, not scary, that happens to me Sometimes I play uh, those games where you have a grid of letters and you need to find words in the grid. And it happens to me that my hand is going and finding a word before I even realize consciously that that thing happened. And it's a very weird thing. And I'm, perhaps you've experienced that. All right. So now let's get into the meat of things. There is a inbuilt loop hardwired into your brain that is the key to habits. You have a cue, which is a trigger that tells your brain when and which habit to use. You have a routine, activity, emotion, or behavior. You have a reward, which is how your brain decides whether this is good or not. And the example here is something like you, you're feeling bored, routine, you grab a bottle of wine, presumably drink it, reward, you feel relaxed and happy. And this is a habit that may very well work, right? It, but it can also go so out of, uh, get so expanded that you drink too much wine, right? or it can just be for the one bottle and that, that would work fine. So the same mechanism can lead to other things like addiction and so on. Uh, one thing that I like to point out, um, they mentioned in the article about emotions. Often emotional responses are triggered by certain cues and without even realizing you go with that habit of responding in a specific emotional way to an existing cue. Uh, and this is something that you may need to, uh, to deal with, right? Um, especially working in a team, sometimes your reactions might not be the best. And I've often seen in teams when they start to work to actually work together, that it's quite hard uh, to figure out these things, and you need they need to work with themselves to stop responding to those cues. All right, and now there are three models for habits that we know. There's three books. Uh, first one is called uh, Just a moment that you can actually see it. So the first one is called The Power of Habit. This is an older book that talks about um, the science of habits. It is a bit outdated. Uh, 
and we'll see why. One of the things it said is that you need uh, something like 60 something days to get rid of a habit, but we'll see that this has actually been, uh, or actually not to get rid of a habit, to adopt a new habit, but we'll see that this has actually been uh, changed uh, in the literature. Um, the second one is called Atomic Habits, and this discusses about very tiny changes that you can make in your daily routines that will make you have better habits, better results. And the third one, which is what I'll mostly focus on, it, ha it doesn't have the best cover, but it has, the author is somebody who has worked on this for years and years and years. He has worked on behavior. He has a PhD in this thing. So he knows what he's talking about. Uh, tiny habits, the small, the small changes that change everything. Uh, by B.J. Fogg. This, uh, if you search for B.J. Fogg on YouTube, you'll find a number of uh, videos where he talks about uh, the content of this book, or you can read the book if you want to learn more. So we'll talk about these three models, but fundamentally, I'm mostly interested in tiny habits. All right. So now we have this groundwork. Um, and uh, we will build on this groundwork, the first step being we need to analyze the habits. So we now know what habits are. We know where they come from. First step before adopting a new habit, changing a habit, let's analyze them. Um, how do we analyze the habits? Well, we have this model, Q, routine, reward. So we can write a habit in this form. After a Q, I do routine because reward. And I would like to ask you to think about some of your habits, good or bad, doesn't matter. And let's try to think not only about the habit that you have, but also about the cue and about the reward. What triggers your habit of, uh, I don't know, what was here? Let's see if we can find one. Uh, what triggers your habit of being impatient during sprint retrospectives? Uh, the routine is obviously that one. Uh, but And what is the reward? What is the reward you get out of it, right? This analysis is the key to identifying your habits, the key to understanding what habits are useful for you and how you can change them. Because we will see that in order to adopt a new habit, you need to figure out the cue or the cues. And often there are more than one cue. It's not necessary to have a single cue to something. So let's see, anybody finding one of these? <laughs> Before going shopping, I do eat something because then I buy less food. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good approach. <laughs> um, one habit I have, um, I use in my uh, development, uh, whenever I use test-driven development, I have some built-in cue, some built-in cues, yes. I have a cue when my test passes, right? When my test passes, then I can commit. And I often do that. After I turn on the TV, I do get a snack because, well, probably because your brain is telling you yeah, it makes you happier somehow. Um, so that I feel, okay. So that I feel strengthened before the stressful meeting. Right before meetings, I go grab a coffee cigarette so that I feel strengthened before the stressful meeting. Okay. 
So you see that this analysis is not as easy as it sounds. It's often quite quite difficult to to figure this out. Uh, there is a story in one of the books I don't remember precisely which one, with a guy who figured out that he was going to eat a cake every time every day at a certain uh, time, like I don't know four p.m. or something like that. And he wanted to get rid of this habit. And initially he thought that it was um, just the cake. You know, this was the cue because, you know, he's hungry or blood pressure is low, uh, blood, sorry, sugar, <laughs> sugar uh, content, blood sugar is low and then uh, he needed something. But it turned out that it was much more complex than that because he wasn't only eating the cake, he was meeting a friend and they started chatting and he, uh, his friend would eat something and say, so he would go and grab a cake and there were multiple cues involved there. And it was very interesting to listen to this. I also know somebody from, uh, from the craft community who used to drink a lot of Coke and he thought about the cues for drinking Coke. And it turned out that one of them was that he was thirsty, but that you can replace that with water. But another cue was that um, he felt like his mouth was not clean and then he would use Coke. And instead he started brushing his teeth multiple times a day and that would uh, reduce his habit of drinking Coke. So it's a bit more complicated than it looks. But this is a good model to start from, to start analyzing. So if we know now about this model, Q routine reward, we can look at changing habits. How can we change the habits? And here we will look at, uh, first is the, the atomic habits model. Um, and it says a few things. We can make the cue really easy to see. So if you want to adopt a new habit, for example, write tests, right? Or refactor before committing to production, or, you know, then you need a cue that is very obvious. Very easy to see, very easy to hear, very easy to reach, right? Uh, the activity has to be, the reaction has to be quite simple. So if you say, uh, starting tomorrow, I will write better code, which I hear many teams discussing the retrospectives and living with this, uh, that won't work, that's too big. It has to be something easier to do. I will rename one thing, right? Just do that, just rename one thing before you commit to production or before you push to whatever, the main branch. Um, you can make the uh, cue something attractive, right? You can make the cue something satisfying, in which case you need to analyze and see what is satisfying. However, this is still quite complicated. So we look at the other the BJ Fogg model, which is related to tiny habits. Uh, so what he's saying, uh, what this model is saying is that a habit is given and a behavior in this case, but most of the behavior, as we've seen, 40% of behavior is about habits. You have, it's a combination of motivation, ability, and, pro and prompts. Right. So let's say you get a prompt, uh, your test is green. So now your, my habit would be commit. Once I committed, refactor something. Cool. Now, if I don't have enough motivation to do that, I will fail. I will end up in the prompts fail here area, which is beneath the action line. Uh, if I don't have the ability to do that, I don't know how to refactor. I'm using a new ID. I'm using Vim and I have never used Vim. Uh, it's 
if I don't have this ability, or I, don't, I don't have the skill to refactor, again, things will fail. So the genius part from uh, folks' tiny habits is that he said, make the habit so tiny that it is impossible to fail it. <clears throat> it's impossible to say, it's just so, so um, easy that you cannot basically fail it <clears throat> and reinforce your habit with a celebration. And he gives examples of a few types of celebration. <coughs> no, sorry. Um, some people say yay, some people dance a bit after they've done um, one of the habits um, and so on. And so he came up with this idea of doing really, really tiny habits, very difficult to have, and a very clear prompt. So now let's think about this idea for a moment. Um, that's the point of if you have very tiny habits. So what he's saying he does is do one push up after IP. Sorry for the language, but that's actually taken from his, uh, his book and his presentations. This is something that he done. It takes a few seconds and then celebrate and say, oh, I did one push up. Cool. And if you get into these habits, he ended up doing like, I don't know, 70 push ups a day because of that. Sometimes less, sometimes more. Because if he does one push up, he often will do two, three, four. Right. And if he does only one, then no problem. It's only one. Yay. Celebrate. Very tiny habit very difficult, very clear, uh, very clear prompt, you know, precisely when, right? It's just one push up and you see the three seconds, it takes precisely, I don't know, three seconds to do that. It's not hard, you cannot fail it. Right? Unless you have some physical problems that prevent you from doing push ups. Right. Very, very easy. So if you do that, then imagine what happens in time, <clears throat> because in time, this gets better and better. Another example that he gives is floss one tooth after washing my teeth. So you don't do, uh, you don't floss all your teeth, you just floss one tooth. And it's so ridiculously easy it could probably do more teeth, right? Uh, and then celebrate, always remember to celebrate. So with this being said, we learn about tiny habits, we learn what they mean. Do think about something that's so small, you cannot possibly fail, but that will grow into something that actually helps you in time. Uh, let's talk about developer habits. If you look at the literature, uh, when we look at extreme programming, when we look at software craft, which are the things that we wish we do more? Well, here are a few of them. I'm sure there are more and you can come up with more examples. Commit often. I see too often people who commit still to this day, uh, once a day, once every few days, and then they struggle with uh, marches and all those weird things. No, oh, commit very often. Refactor mercilessly. Whenever you see something that's not quite right in your design, do a refactoring. Write documentation. I, I kid a lot about documentation because I, I think that documentation is that thing that all developers complain that it doesn't exist, but very few developers want to write. Okay, so it might be a good uh, habit to start writing documentation. And it's worth thinking why 
do we have such a challenge in writing documentation? Perhaps we start too far away. Perhaps we need to start with a tiny habit first. Use good names. How do you start using good names? There are a few heuristics and so on, but you need to think about those names. You need perhaps to look into a, a dictionary or a thesaurus and figure out what those names mean and if there are better synonyms or better names for the things that you are using to perhaps talk to some people, uh, domain experts, so on. Write tests, use test-driven development, use things like low coupling and high cohesion, right? So these are things that we wish we do as developers because these things will help us. <clears throat> if you have good names, it will be easier for you to work with your code base. If you have tests, it will be easier for you to work with that code base and so on. If you have good documentation, yeah, definitely. So now the question is, given this, Let's think together, what would be the tiniest testing habit? What is the smallest thing that you could do given a prompt? What would be a prompt? What is the thing that you could do to, that you cannot fail when it comes to testing? No matter how complex your uh, code base is, no matter whether it has tests, whether it's legacy code, in what language it's written. <laughs> it compiles push. <laughs> That's definitely not what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we're talking about writing some tests. What is the simplest thing you can do to write tests? All right, no answer. Let me give you an answer. <laughs> I see a few examples, one method, one test called the objects constructor. I have an even better one for you. Just write an assert false in a test. That's it, write an assert false. You'll have a failing test and that's a good prompt for your uh, to kick in your TDD habit, right? Because you always start with a failing test. So start with an assert false. It's something you cannot fail, right? And then celebrate because you have a failing test. You just wrote a failing test. And it's so weird, ridiculous, that you'll probably want to do more, right? And it's okay if you only do... Uh, Nasar false, and then you remove that test. Uh, you won't be able to, right? It's, it's so easy. So perhaps in some days you won't have the mental energy to do that. Anymore. But just doing this small habit, this tiny habit, writing an Nasar false, running the test, it fails. Okay, now we remove it. It will give you a prompt for your next habit. And after a week, perhaps you can start linking to this. So when I see a red test, let's turn it green or let's call something from my code. So easy, right? It's ridiculous. And I'm not saying this is the best example. It's just an example of a very small thing that you could do. Let's see another one. Uh, let's say we want to get into the habit of committing often. I see some comments in the chat. If I start celebrating with the surf falls, I'll get way over the Balmer peak before the working day ends. Yeah, but you just do it once. Or just do it... Um, after you think you finished a task or before starting a new task. Or when you start your ID, you start your ID in the morning, write an SR files. That's so easy. Okay. Uh, a 
Okay, so I see Alexander commit after a successful test about commit often habit. Yeah, that's when you have tests, that's a very good prompt. If you don't have tests, uh, then you need another prompt. After I change your function, commit locally, then celebrate. Or after my test pass, commit, then celebrate. So these are just examples and they are, the thing that I want to get across is that it's okay for these things to be ridiculous. It's okay for these things to be ridiculously easy because that's what we are looking on. I think one of the biggest problems we have in this industry is that we try to shift our way of working from what we learn in university where we are given a problem that is well-defined and which has one solution that is accepted to what we do in the real world as software developers, which is we don't precisely know what the problem is. We know parts of the problem, but we know the problem will evolve in time. And even for that part of the problem, there are a number of different solutions that we need to go uh, to think about or to try out and some of them are better fit, some of them are less fit, but there are also some of the solutions which are actually quite similar for our particular context. And we are trying to make this complete switch very quickly by using test-driven development and so on, and it doesn't work. It's very, very hard. So perhaps, you know, tiny habits might help. All right. And now the interesting thing is that you can chain habits. Once you have a once you have a habit that you're doing on the same prompt and you notice that it, it's not conscious anymore. It's something that you do. It's something that you do. Just do. Now you can start stacking habits or chaining them. For example, if I commit after each uh, passing test, then I can add another habit. After I commit, do a rename. Would this be so difficult? Probably not. You could, right? <clears throat> and then celebrate. And remember the celebration phase. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it is actually good. It's something good. Cheering when your test is green, for example, really good. And I often discuss with uh, people who um, are doing test driven development for a very long time. And they tell me that when the test turns green, there's something, you know, going up. It's like there's uh, some pleasure hit, something going up in the brain. You feel better. But yeah with advanced, even if it's something ridiculous, like you've added a new if statement in your, <laughs> in your uh, code. Okay. Um, another thing I, I could do is after I commit to look away for 10 seconds so that my eyes uh, get some rest. That would be quite useful. Okay. So now let's talk a bit about some additional things related to habits. This is the core of what I wanted to talk about, but there are a few more things that contribute to this. And I want to go a little through them so that you get more, more information. So remember this, we were talking about motivation ability. <clears throat> and prompts, and that prompts fail. When you have low motivation, low ability, prompts will fail, right? One way of dealing with this is to get very easy habits. Another thing that you can do is to increase your ability. How can you increase your ability? Using deliberate practice. And there's actually here, uh, there's, a book that I'm currently reading called Experts, written by um, 
Dr. Roger Nibon, who, who is an expert in how expertise works. And it's absolutely fascinating. I don't have time to go through this, but it is incredibly interesting. And one of the keys is deliberate practice. And deliberate practice means very focused practice uh, with feedback. And often this practice will look like something ridiculous, like something that you feel doesn't make sense. It will take you out of your comfort zone. But that is how you increase your ability. By doing some very weird things, uh, you can increase your ability little by little until you realize, oh, so now it's easy to do refactoring. Now it's easy to do test-driven development. But you need to put in the time to, to make this practice and to put in the focus to do this and to get the feedback. Uh, and another one, which I will be talking in a moment, is increasing your motivation. And this is often a very complex topic and discussed and over discussed and so on. But I will give you one way of increasing your motivation that works that I've experienced on myself. And that way of increasing motivation is take more responsibility. We'll discuss about this in a minute, but it is incredibly useful when you decide for yourself to take more responsibility that will motivate you like nothing else i've seen it's it's amazing from a psychological perspective the wonders it can make um, we can also do something with prompts we can make the prompts social so if you are doing if you are programming in a mob uh, then you'll have this social reinforcement where people tell, oh, let's write the test first. What are you doing? Let's refactor this. Uh, and this is, or when you are pair programming or where you are doing, um, going to communities and trying out new things. So now I like to look beyond habits. I like to look to a daily routine. And I'll explain in a moment why I believe a daily routine is very interesting. I've noticed that people who have daily routines tend to be more content, more happy. Uh, they have a kind of stillness about their uh, everyday emotional life. It's, they can focus on the nice things in, in life, <laughs> in a way. Uh, and I noticed that particularly um, in my in-laws house, which is a farm, and there's a built-in routine in a farm. You need to go, you need to feed the animals, you need, you know, it's a lot of things that you need to do at certain times. And it gives you a structure for the day and a structure that I've often missed as a software development. Probably, I imagine a similar structure is something that a person who's gone through military uh, service can, can attest to. So here I am proposing something. This is not fully tested. I'm just giving you some ideas to try out. So I'm proposing a routine formed out of three steps. Warming up your brain, doing your daily stuff, and then wind down your brain. Nothing really weird until here, right? So what would warm up your brain? And many people say coffee, but it's not only that. So your brain, remember, your brain needs energy. Where do you take that energy? It turns out that um, by doing some cardio workout, which doesn't have to be long, you get more oxygen, your brain wakes up. So I started doing these uh, morning jumps for about 15 seconds or even more, two minutes, three minutes, whenever I can, sometimes with pauses. Uh, and these really wake me up. These are really good. I feel my brain, you know, coming to uh, full, full power. Some people do meditation. 
really good because it allows you to focus and clean out your thoughts and kind of focused on what's behind you. Uh, no, what's behind you, what's before you. Another thing I'm proposing, doing a 15 minutes cold kata. You know, you get to work and then you get a coffee and then you, well, now getting to work is going to your living room probably, but <laughs> if you would go to an office, you do this, you would go and start typing in, uh, you know, in the chat or going to daily meetings. And so I kind of go with what's going on to you instead of being present. And a 15 minute code kata, something very simple. It doesn't have to be complete. You don't have to finish this. This will warm you up towards, uh, warm, you up, warm up your skills fundamentally your fingers, your, you know, keyboard and so on. And then for me, it's very useful to remember what's ahead of me. I look at the calendar, I look at my board and I say, okay, so today I'm going to do this, this and this. And just remember that. And then I read engineering notes. Uh, I'll come back to this in a moment, what I mean by those. So this is something that will help you warm up. And then what can you do during the day? We all have some calendar events, but then it's TDD cycles are incredibly useful for structuring your day because they give you that continuous motion and they give you moments to break and so on. You can also use Pomodoro, although I've used, um, I don't like working only for half an hour. I've tried it, doesn't quite work for me. I like to focus on one thing and depending on the task, do half an hour, one hour, two hours, but also get some, some moments to stop. Uh, and that's why one of my challenges is to figure out when to break. So not all good, but you can try Pomodoro. So when you wind down, we often leave the office and now it's even worse probably because you, you leave your living room and you close your chat and so on. And then you take all the baggage with you and you keep going with that baggage. And that's a problem. So one thing that I learned works for me is writing, dumping down everything I've done in the day for a specific task. And I'm writing it in a file. Uh, we have a kind of a, a cloud where I can write some notes and I'm writing there for a specific task. For me, it's often infrastructure. And I'm writing, okay, so I did that and that thing didn't work. And now the questions for next time is, are these, this, and this, I haven't solved this perhaps. I think one of the solutions would be this, this, and this, and I kind of dump everything from my head in that file, which I then read at the beginning of next day when I take uh, the task again. And this takes me out of the work. It's also possible to write something in team chat this is what I achieved today, blah, 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 uh, and so on. And to do, perhaps you can also try to do a checkout ritual, uh, which can be as simple as saying, okay, I'm leaving, say a bit about what you've done. Or it can be as, uh, can be something more fun, like, you know, let's have a, a drink with uh, the colleagues, even if it's remote. Let's just have, and it doesn't matter what you are drinking. Well, let's let's have a drink together, say bye, and uh, we'll see you next morning. So rituals can be very important. So these are some things that you can do to wind down and just leave your problems behind. They will still be in your brain at some level, but at least you can focus on other things. And one of the last parts is about uh, meta habits. Um, BJ Fogg noticed that there are a few habits that influence everything else. Meditation, sleeping, uh, workouts, 
these are things that influence your physical well-being and for example one of the things that happen if you meditate you sleep better if you sleep better you kind of grow into one of these uh, good cycles and i try to give some examples for developers uh, engineering notes for me it's one of the things that changed everything it's a meta habit i can do it for any kind of task it helps me check out from a task deliberate practice mentioned it something that allows you to increase your ability again and again and again and again making it easier to uh, improve or to get more habits assertive communication i too often see people who are either aggressive or too submissive in their communication learning how to communicate assertively will fundamentally change the relations in teams and finally, this is one that is really important, taking responsibility. And I want to give you some examples of taking responsibility. Take responsibility to mentor somebody or to um, or promise a deadline and actually keep it, you know, or accept a project that you have no idea how we'll do it and then figure out how you do it. And sometimes you will fail when you take that responsibility, but you will learn so much more and you will be extremely motivated when you do so, because it's something that you took on. It's something that you feel uh, it's important. <clears throat> All right, so this takes us to the end and then I'll be very happy to listen to and have a chat about your questions. I repeat what we started with. We are driven by habits. Uh, habits are a way to reduce brain energy consumption because your brain is consuming a lot of energy. The last part that evolved from our brain is the part that deals with decision making and is the first part to shut down. And you will go through the motions without realizing what you're doing mm -hmm. because it becomes unconscious. Some habits uh, help our goals, others don't. So we want better habits. And in order to do so, we've seen the question we started was, what can we do? What can we do? Find tiny habits adopt a very tiny version of a habit that you want on a very clear prompt. It's impossible to fail. We'll just do it. And this will help you adopt some habits. Increase ability through deliberate practice. Want to do refactoring, want to deal better legacy code, want to do uh, test driven development, want to learn more about design deliberate practice, want to learn more about architecture, deliberate practice. You can increase prompts by making them social. If you are in a group and you know, you will feed each other the prompts. And now the interesting thing, if you think about these techniques, test driven development, extreme programming, Scrum, they have built in prompts and routines. I know many developers hate on the daily meeting in Scrum. But it is, if you find in yourself to switch your view on that meeting, and instead of seeing it as, oh, this product owner asks me to see if what I've done, and well, well, so boring. And instead you see it as, okay, let me warm up. What do I need to do today? What did I do yesterday? What is the rest of the team going? How can I contribute the most to my team? then suddenly it becomes a really, really good prompt and a really good routine. And uh, I talked, I think, about the importance of responsibility and what it means. Take responsibility for something and actually work on it. It will increase your motivation. Before I close, a few things I like to share and to plug. We have a conference coming up, architectureitakeonconf.com. If you are interested in software architecture, 
it's a good place to learn. It's an online remote event. Craftacademy.mosaicworks.com is a place where you can see um, what some of our learning programs. And these are architecture and code design learning programs. We have a bunch that I'm very proud of and I and are we are doing them in a format that allows you to to learn as much as possible and to retain your uh, skills. And we have a bunch of free webinars tomorrow. It's a free webinar on architecture diagrams at code. If you want to join, there's still time. You can also watch the recording afterwards. With this being said, I would like to thank you all. Uh, it's been a complete blast for me. And I'm very eager to listen to you and to see what questions you, you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for the very interesting talk. We have already some questions and I will uh, forward or speak them out uh, for everyone. Please add your questions. Um, we will pick it up. So the first question is from Lucas. How to find the right amount of celebration? Three times a day, mm -hmm. 10 times a day? Is it or more? Is it enough to be happy at the end, at the end of the day? What uh, BJ Fogg recommends, and this is his research on habits and how they um, they become better. Remember that at the end of the cycle of forming habits, there is this loop where the brain looks, uh, was this a good habit or not? And so by celebrating after each small habit, you are reinforcing that loop. So fundamentally, what you should do is to uh, celebrate after every time that you've actually done a small habit. And now in time, this will not feel necessary anymore because the habit will get ingrained in your brain. So when I first started doing um, test driven development, I used to be very happy whenever my test was green and I was like, yeah, cool, now it's working. And often when I pair with people who are not doing test driven development for, uh, have not done this for a while, when the test is green, I say, ah, cool, celebrate, now it works. Even if sometimes we are just advancing a little bit, right? It's not that much. Uh, and, but the, when I'm doing this alone, I don't celebrate anymore, but I still feel a kick in my, <laughs> in my brain <laughs> when the test is green. But that is because I celebrated in the beginning. It all makes sense after reading about this book. So celebrate after every... <laughs> every now, one thing that you might not want to do is to get 10, to try to get 10 habits at once, <laughs> 10 new habits, right? Pick one, pick two, and then you won't celebrate, you know, every 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. The next question is from Roland. What is a kata? Okay, um, I, yeah, very good question. Uh, what I'm particularly talking about is a coding kata. A kata in martial arts is a repeated exercise that you do. And I had never done martial arts, so I'm going to do some weird movements here. But it's a repeated exercise that you do and your master or whatever it's called is looking at you and saying, okay, so uh, your hand to the left, to the right, and so on. This concept has been... Um, has moved to uh, sports like tennis. So in tennis, you will often see people, and one of the reasons tennis is so competitive nowadays is because, for example, they do a lot of training initially without any ball. So they just do the movement and the trainer is looking, the coach is looking and saying, oh, no, you are not using your muscles correctly, you are not positioning correctly and so on. So this is what a kata is. It's a repeated exercise where you also get the feedback and you learn more out of it. And now we transfer this to software development. 
uh, and there's a bunch of exercises that you can find this if you search for coding kata very simple exercises that you can do using test driven development using uh, these types of techniques that we are talking about and the idea is to take the same problem uh, and work on it let's say 15 minutes 30 minutes but focused a lot on the steps that you are doing so have a red test have a green uh, turn it green by implementing the minimal code that makes it work and then refactor and in the beginning it's weird uh, and it's actually all the time is weird if it is a bit weird it means it's good because you are learning something new um, so that's what it is repeated exercise ideally you get some feedback on your technique from somebody if you are doing pair programming or if you have a coach uh, or you can record yourself put it out there and ask people for feedback on your video it's probably even simpler to do it uh, this way nowadays and it's one way of doing deliberate practice and it's a very nice way to warm up your brain to programming because maybe you know you woke up you had your coffee you're not yet warmed up for programming <laughs> probably need a bit of a kick okay thank you very much maybe you can add also what is a dojo because kata and dojo is all uh, sometimes used in combination yeah coding dojo uh, I've actually talked on our YouTube channel. I interviewed one of the people who did Coding Dojo in London for, I don't even know, more than 10 years now, uh, every two weeks. And uh, a Coding Dojo is a place where you gather as a community. Um, and there are variants to it, but one variant is your pair program there somebody comes introduces a problem so you don't have to pick a problem introduces a problem introduces some constraints for example use test driven development use pair programming and then you pair program for like 30 to 45 minutes and then you share what you've learned and you do another session and uh, usually it ends after one and a half to two hours uh, with a retrospective. Uh, there's a variant to this where you uh, switch pairs. Uh, and it's, I mean, there's somebody in the front working on a projector and um, there's always pair programming. You work on the same problem. Everybody works on the same problem. Uh, but you switch, somebody leaves the chair like every seven minutes or so, somebody else comes in. And if you've done more programming, it's close to a dojo, not quite the same, <laughs> but it's uh, it was one of the inspirations. Coding dojo in this format was one of the inspirations for, um, for more programming. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is from me, and you already answered it uh, in between, but I ask it anyway. Can you re recommend specific practical steps to switch from test last to TDD? So this is a very interesting one, because I think we are often underestimating the complexity of switching to test-driven development. We often jump into I want to do test driven development because I've heard it's great because I don't know, Kent Beck is doing it or whatever. There's some factor of um, people who have been doing it and it sounds interesting. But we have some fundamental challenges. The first challenge is that we, we are very much trained on learning a lot about uh, we are very much trained about thinking of solutions instead of problems. One thing that is different about test driven development is that you need to take a larger problem and to split it into smaller problems and to kind of start seeing how adding us and believing that if you solve one small problem after the next, you'll end up with a solution that is good for your 
um, for your uh, code base. So with this being said, what this means is that I think the first interesting step would be to practice this, practice splitting a larger problem into small problems. And I won't go a lot into details. If you want to ask me later on in the chat, uh, I can give you some, some ideas. Um, but there are some methods of going uh, through this, um, which help. Also, what doesn't help if, is if you try to do this on a legacy code base, where you don't have tests, uh, that multiplies the challenge 10 times, probably. So start with small katas, try to figure them out, perhaps work with somebody who knows this, and then you will get much more out of the technique much faster. And then there are some steps that you can take to learn how to split larger problems into smaller problems, which will kind of lead to everything else. Um, so that's, yeah. Thank you very much. The next question is from Lucas. He writes, I feel stressed throughout the day. This gets in the way of improving myself. What is a good mitigation strategy? So I've learned one thing about stress. Um, we often think that stress is a bad thing, but it's actually not necessarily a bad thing. Stress is uh, your body's answer to a challenge. So whenever you are faced with a challenge, uh, your blood pressure elevates, uh, you are ready to run. You know, if you are in the jungle and the lion would come to you, you are suddenly stressed because you need <laughs> and you run very fast. Uh, but stress has gotten a really bad name. Uh, and the problem with stress is when it's chronic, when it's continuous, when you feel stress all the time then you probably have a trigger, probably an emotional trigger, or you don't accept yourself. And it's a psychological issue and it's best discussed with experts in psychology. So somebody who's a clinical psychologist would help a lot with identifying the triggers and helping you mitigate this. But other than that, I also feel stressed during the, the day sometimes. Um, but what I take it uh, is as being, okay, I have a challenge, but now I'm ready. My body is helping me overcome the challenge. So I get really focused. I concentrate. I, I remember what I need to do. I mumble to myself, okay, so now I need to do this. Then I need to do that. Then I need to do that. And after half an hour, 45 minutes is gone because I've solved the problem. The trigger has gone away. But I can't stress this enough. <laughs> Sorry for the pun, it's not intended. If you do feel stress all during the day and it's something chronic that you cannot get uh, out of, you cannot figure out the triggers, you cannot figure out how to change your emotional response so that you are not stressed, go see a specialist because it, it leads to very, very uh, high probability of uh, heart disease and all kinds of bad stuff. So don't, don't let it uh, just sit there. Uh, Thank you very much. The next question is from Cedric. He writes, sometimes I feel like we give up routines when we get stressed by pressures or specific deadlines coming soon. I think we may be afraid of losing any pre precious minute to finish our work. How to overcome that? So, you know, um, I mentioned the book of uh, Roger Kneebone, who, who was actually a surgeon. Uh, and he's the book about expertise and experts. This guy was a surgeon in South Africa. He's British, but he was a surgeon in South Africa for 10 years or something like that. And he talks about this, uh, you know, it's... You know, it's an emergency. As a surgeon, <laughs> you have emergencies all the time. You know, your patient might die. It's an actual deadline, right? We don't have actual deadlines. Rarely people die when we don't deliver on time. <laughs> uh, but for these people, it's actually deadlines. And 
uh, they fall on their routines. This is the only way. There's no other way. So actually building a good routine that you can sustain, that you believe in, that works, this is the thing that will get you out of, will get you the most value for your time. Um, and you do this by deliberate practice. You do this by um, getting a bit out of your comfort zone, expanding your expertise and so on. Whenever I have an emergency, whenever I know something is going wrong in on our infrastructure, which I'm maintaining, I snap into some of those routines and I'm really focused and I'm doing a few things, but I, I'm doing those steps that I've trained to do and I've done again and again and again. One of the worst things you can do when you are in an emergency situation is to start uh, second guessing yourself because that will actually slow you down. So usually this is a symptom that you don't own your practices yet. You need to practice more so that those practices are your second nature and it's something that you do on a snap. Excellent. So we covered all the questions and I think now it's a good time to switch over to uh, wonder.juke dot ch uh, markus in the background will end now the session and okay. we will be all redirected automatically into wonder.jock.ch so see you, there. <laughs> <laughs> see you all there in a in a second or so <laughs>